John, from what Eric tells me, you're going to show him how to track down electrical troubles. How you planning to go about it? Why, I fixed up four problem cars, Tech. All have different electrical conditions. By means of simple tests, Eric can learn how to put his finger quickly on the cause of trouble in each case. Sounds great, Don. Eric ought to go for that. Well, I don't know, fellas. Like oil and water, electrical work and I don't mix very well. But I'm game. Well, that's good enough for me. Let's tackle the first car. A case of hard starting and see. By turning on the headlamps, for instance, and cranking the engine, we can learn a lot. Well, that I gotta see. And that you will see, Eric. If the lights go out or get very dim, there's high resistance somewhere that's stealing voltage from the circuit. Probably a loose or badly corroded battery cable connection. Sounds possible. Let's try it out. Hey, these headlamps almost black out. Guess there's high resistance or maybe battery trouble, right? Yeah. Ordinarily, we'd check the battery first. But this acts more like high resistance. So let's look at the cable connections. Feel how loose this starter cable is? And yet it looked tight. Let's clean and tighten it. OK, Don. Have it ready in a minute. And now let's see if that did any good. Boy, what a difference. Right. That shows the importance of clean and tight connections. Here's another point you should remember. A poor cable connection can also cause a partially discharged battery. That's because it's hard for the generator to charge the battery when it has to overcome high resistance caused by a bad connection. High resistance in the charging circuit acts on the regulator the same as a fully charged battery. This causes the charging rate to be reduced too quickly. I see. So correcting high resistance takes care of low batteries as well as poor starting. That it does. But remember that other causes sometimes knock batteries down and cause hard starting. Now, suppose we look at the second car. Good idea. Let's crank the engine on that next car and watch the lights. Say, these lights don't dim much, but the engine doesn't start either. What now? Well... Let me show you a quick test that will tell you where the trouble might be. Good ignition, remember, begins with good primary voltage to the ignition coil. A voltage test while cranking will show us if voltage to the coil is high enough for good ignition. Turn the selector switch on this voltmeter to 16 volt position. Connect the negative lead to a good ground. Before connecting the positive lead, keep this in mind. 58 models have the ballast resistor between the ignition switch and the coil. You must connect the positive voltmeter lead to the switch side of the resistor. Well, why is that important? Well, if you connect the voltmeter to the coil side, the resistor will drop voltage. You'll get a low voltage reading that could give you a bum steer on this test. OK. Positive lead goes on the ignition switch side of the resistor. Right. Now connect a jumper on the distributor side of the coil to ground out the primary circuit. It keeps the engine from starting during this test. Can't you pull the high tension lead from the distributor to keep the engine from starting? You can do that if you ground it. High voltage in an ungrounded secondary circuit can damage the coil or set off sparks that can cause a fire. Watch out for cars with the resistor on the distributor side of the coil. Tech's right. Some early models were wired that way. In that case, you'd connect the jumper to the distributor side of the resistor. If you connect the jumper to the coil side of the resistor, current will be too high. That's because the resistor won't cut down current, and you'll really French fry the ignition wiring. So remember, when the resistor is on the distributor side of the coil, you connect the voltmeter directly to the coil on the ignition switch side. Got those differences straight? I think so, Don. All right. Now crank the engine about 15 seconds and watch the voltmeter. OK, Don. Cranking voltage is 9.7. Fine. 
and cranking speed is good. So trouble on this car is most likely in the distributor. If cranking voltage were less than 9.6, we'd look for loose connections in the circuit to the coil. Ignition switch contacts might be burned, for example. Is there an easy way to check that? Sure. Just crank the engine several times and see if the voltage reading is the same each time. If it isn't, the switch isn't making a good contact every time. That could give you trouble. Now, in this case, our cranking voltage was better than 9.6, and the speed was good. So let's use the voltmeter to test for high resistance in the distributor primary circuit. Connect the voltmeter on the distributor side of the coil. Just remove the jumper and connect the voltmeter positive lead in its place. Now, the ignition's on and the breaker points are closed. What does the voltmeter say? Almost three-tenths, Don. That's a pretty big voltage drop, isn't it? Yep, and it tells us that the trouble's in the distributor for sure. There's either burn points or a loose connection. Might as well pull the distributor for bench test and inspection. What causes points to burn? Well, if points are set too close, they'll burn. The condenser can't do its job of soaking up enough of the current to prevent arcing. Or, if the points are not lined up right, they'll burn on one edge because they won't dissipate heat properly. Oh, I get it. Oil or grease on the points can make them burn, too. So will a defective condenser. In addition, if the voltage regulator is set too high, the distributor points will burn. Don't overlook this possibility. Good point, Don. A high voltage setting can cause trouble throughout the electrical system. I'll remember that, Tech. Now, getting back to this car. We had a voltage drop of three-tenths. Suppose the voltage drop hadn't been that high. Where would you check next? Well, when voltage drop is less than one-tenth, and there's still ignition trouble, you check the secondary ignition circuit. Specifically, you check for corrosion at distributor cap towers and at the ignition coil tower. Besides that, you check for a burned rotor or arcing at the terminals inside the cap. If those points are okay, you check the wires and spark plugs, you know, burn electrodes, gap, and so on. I see. Well, the thing to do here is pull the distributor and go through it, right? Yeah, Eric, but let's do that later. Right now, let's move over to the next car and see what we can find. Good suggestion, Don. But before you do that, somebody please turn this record over. All right, let's see if we can find out what's wrong with this car. Uh, do we crank the engine with the lights on? Yep, good place to start. Go watch the lights. Uh, I can't tell, Don. It's not cranking as fast as the first two cars, but the lights aren't dimming too much. Might even be normal. Slow cranking and failure to start is the problem. Looks like a toss-up, then, as to where to start checking. You can start by testing either the starting circuit or by testing the battery. I vote for the battery, Don. We have to know what condition it's in. I'll buy that, Tech. Now, before you use this hydrometer, Eric, notice how clean it's been kept. In a dirty tube, the float can stick to the sides and give you a false reading. You also know about uh, correcting for temperature of the solution? Oh, yeah. Add four points for each 10 degrees above 80. Subtract four for each 10 degrees below 80. Okay. 1260 is what we need for a fully charged battery. All cells should test the same, within 25 gravity points. No trouble on that score, Don. All cells are just under 1260, and each cell is within 25 points of the others. That's pretty good for a new car. <laughs> I know what you mean, Tech. Nothing kills a customer's enthusiasm for his new car like a dead battery. After a new car gets jockeyed around a few times between the factory and the dealer, and is kept in storage for a while, the battery's apt to be pretty low when the car is delivered to the owner. So, we should be sure the battery is fully charged before we deliver a new car. Now, if you had a battery with some variation between cells, and the specific gravity was about 1225, you wouldn't know whether that battery could deliver enough voltage under high cranking loads. 
To find that out, we'd make a battery capacity test. Oh? How's that capacity test made? Well, you test it with this battery starter tester. It has a carbon pile rheostat connected in series with an ammeter. Turn the rheostat off before you connect the ammeter leads to the battery. Next, the voltmeter leads are connected to the battery terminals. Be sure the voltmeter clips make good contact at the battery posts. You adjust the rheostat control knob until the ammeter shows 200 amps. That puts a good load on the battery. Let the battery discharge at that rate for about 15 seconds. With a battery discharging at 200 amps, read the battery voltage. If it is 9.5 or more, battery capacity is okay. Very clear, Don. But what if a battery didn't pass the capacity test? Well, if a battery fails the capacity test, you'll have to slow charge and retest it to find out if it can be saved. Incidentally, if a battery tested low, less than 1225, don't make a capacity test because the results wouldn't mean a thing. Good advice, Don. There's another time when a capacity test doesn't mean anything, too. Right. When the battery is cold, below 70 degrees, a capacity test won't do you a bit of good. Right. So in either case, install a good battery before making any more tests. Eric can find more information on that in his reference book. Good news, Tech. I'll look it over. On our car here, then, our battery's okay. Right. And since the lights don't go dim, we know the circuit is okay between the battery and the solenoid. So the trouble's got to be in either the balance of the starting circuit or in the starter itself. How do you find out whether the trouble is in the circuit or in the starter? Why, well, we'll just use the voltmeter to check for voltage drop in the starting circuit. Maximum voltage drop across each part of the circuit should not exceed one-tenth volt for each cable, one-tenth for the switch, and there should be no drop at the terminals and connections. Connect one voltmeter lead to the battery and the other lead to the starter terminal. Crank the engine and read the voltage. Now, I read a little over two-tenths. That's okay, isn't it? Yep. Anything under three-tenths is okay. Good. Now we've eliminated everything right down to the starter itself. That means our next step is to remove the starter and repair it, right? Right. And that's three down and one more to solve. Let's move to the remaining car. Our work order simply says, replace headlight and instrument panel bulb. Got any ideas? Uh, well, I'd kind of like to start the engine and watch the remaining headlamp. Good place to start. Go ahead. Well, the headlight flared up and got real bright when the engine speed increased. That's what I thought. I got a hunch the voltage regulator set too high. A voltage regulator setting that's too high can burn out radio parts, make the battery use water excessively, burn distributor points, and damage all other parts of the electrical system. I see. Good points to remember. Now, before you try to test or adjust the regulator, you'll have to know everything else in the charging circuit is okay. Like what, for instance? Oh, the battery must be 1225 or higher. Uh, wait a minute, Don. If bulbs are burning out and voltage is high, the battery's got to be fully charged, no? No, not necessarily. Remember, high resistance in the charging circuit will reduce the charging rate to the battery. Oh, so that's why we got to check uh, charging circuit resistance before testing or adjusting the regulator, huh? Right. And here's something else. You've got to normalize or warm up the whole charging system before you make any regulator adjustments. That's a mighty important point, Eric. And looky here. Voltage specifications in this reference book give you the voltage settings according to the temperature for a normalized regulator. Good deal, Tech. I can use that information. Now, I guess Eric and I had better get busy and check out this charging circuit. You do that, fellas. In the meantime, I want to urge all technicians to use these tests. 
That'll save you a lot of time and save the customer money because it will cut out the needless replacement of electrical units.